pay attention to the words of this song as we sing it together. Let's rise and sing. Invite the kids. Pardon? Invite, oh, the kid. We welcomed the kid. She's a good kid. Should we do the first part? Yeah, why, why don't we? <laughs> One, two, three. The Lord be with you. We're going to turn together to our text, which is 1 Peter 2. The words are on the screen this morning. And um, as some of you know, I need to get my IV a minute. Here we go. Uh, as some of you know, we oftentimes here follow the lectionary of texts and uh, what's the lectionary? The lectionary is some assigned readings for each Sunday and each holy day in the church's calendar. And there's an Old Testament reading and a psalm reading. There's a gospel reading and there's an epistle reading. And uh, Holly and Al and I and uh, multiple other churches follow this. Uh, ordinarily, we don't feel bound to it, but we follow it. And I oftentimes preach the gospel lesson. I think Pastor Al does as well. And um, it's funny because in the first church that I served in Zealand, uh, that was in the day when, when your sermon title and your text was in a newspaper. And I had lots of people, I don't, a newspaper is one of these paper things. You know. <laughs> uh, so there, incidentally, there was, there's a neighbor who was walking across the sidewalk today 
and we greeted her, and she headed down to the grocery store, and I greeted her again as she walked past, and she had a newspaper, and I, I've not seen that forever. It looked like a scroll. Uh, anyway, uh, so we would have church people open up the, the newspaper, and they would say to me, wow, pastor, it's amazing. What an amazing coincidence that you and so many other pastors are preaching in the same text. If there was the same title, that would be a real problem. So ordinarily, my point is, ordinarily we follow the lectionary, and uh, this week it seemed, while I was on vacation, I kind of felt compelled to step out of that and take this reading from uh, 1 Peter, and uh, part of it is because uh, there's a really important week going on, and it's not just the World Series week that took place. Uh, it's the week ahead. And uh, we live in a divided country and in a, a divided community, and all you have to do is ride down the road and you see neighbors with different uh, political signs. And it seems to me that rather than ignore that, we have, we have to address that. And the addressing that is not telling you how to vote if you haven't already. The addressing that is what is the church's call and commission no matter what the outcome is. So there's lots of energy on what's happening on Tuesday, but I want to say to all of us what's really important is how we respond. No matter what the outcome, how we respond because... Um, Peter doesn't address political candidates, and I'm not either. I'm hoping to play a clean game on this sermon today. But Peter is going to tell us in our relationship with politics and uh, a society, he's going to tell us a couple things about that, that you should feel like you're an alien or an exile or a stranger. You should feel like you don't completely belong. And I suspect many of us feel that way already. The second thing is, he calls us to a new kind of lifestyle that is beyond what we would naturally imagine. And I want to hold that up. I want to hold Peter up and his instruction for us this morning so that we, we take seriously our role to be those who are part of the healing uh, of not only the na neighborhood, but the nation. So how we respond to whatever happens this week is so important. Amen? Amen. So I want to draw on uh, an old, old Hebrew idea. It comes from the Talmud. I want to teach you some Hebrew today. The Hebrew word pair is takun olam. And what it means is to heal the world. It means to repair the world. And the summons of ancient Judaism was for God's people to live in such a way that they were healers of the world. They, they participated in God's work of trying to heal and repair the wor world. Can you say those words? Takun olam. Takun olam. If you don't remember anything about today's sermon, I would love for you to take that into your heart, that that is the role of the church and Peter says it in a sense that live such holy lives that even pagans see you and they give glory to God because they see God's work in you. Takun olam. Before we read, let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we gather in this place today, we thank you for the freedom to gather in your name. And we recognize that we are in a contested time and you have called us to a holy, holy function to act like, sound like, and imitate Christ. So we pray that you would help us to cut through whatever barriers and fears might be in us today to hear your summons, to hear your word. So as we read your word today, as we speak it, as we hear it, as we seek to live it out, help us to be faithful. Help us to be in touch with your spirit in us. So comfort us, challenge us where we need it, 
And we pray that you would help us to join you in the work of repairing your world. You've given us the model and the person of Jesus. Help us to follow him. We pray it in his name. Amen. Before I read today, I just want to make the uh, observation with you that John Calvin, who was um, an amazing reformer, had this to say. He said, the highest calling, the highest calling is not that of a pastor, which should surprise us, those of us who are Calvinists. The highest calling is the civil magistrate who is entrusted by God, to practice fairness and justice for everyone. That's the highest calling, says Calvin. You can disagree, but I stand before that and say, whoa. Let's hear these words from 1 Peter 2. I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm reading the first part as background, and then our verses are 11 through 25. Peter says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here's our text. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 
For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. The past week has been a week of baseball, for those of you who are fans. I have to be honest that uh, baseball is my favorite sport, and I try and keep sports out of church because it's one of our religions today, and people follow it uh, with immense devotion, and pastors always lose when we pick a side because half the congregation loves the other team. And I think it goes that way with politics as well. So I'm not choosing sides, but... I, I had to you know, dig deep into my, my toolbox to come up with a good baseball illustration because the World Series is over. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if Todd Worley knows this, who's the biggest baseball fan I know of in this congregation. But in 2001, PNC Ballpark, that's the Pittsburgh's, uh, uh, Pittsburgh Pirates home stadium. Uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's the, I had the extra sleep, too. They opened up their brand-new stadium, and they did something unheard of. Maybe you know. Uh, they designed this stadium in such a way that everybody said, are you serious? Why are you doing this? This is unheard of. They designed and constructed their new baseball stadium with locker rooms for female umpires. Did you know that? Now, what's the big deal with that? If you follow baseball, you know there are no female umpires. There is a very low glass ceiling in Major League Baseball for female umpires. To this day, there are not female umpires. Uh, there have been some female umpires for spring training games, but uh, you know, like being a pilot, uh, it's an uphill challenge to become a female umpire. They were ahead of their time in 2001. And what they were doing was they were saying, we want to design a stadium and imagine a world where this is coming, where this is possible, even though at the time it was impossible. And everybody said, what are you doing? Because this was way outside the horizon of any way that people were thinking in that day. But you start to wonder, because I think it was about around 2007, where there was more room for some female umpires, and that holds some more possibilities. It's still a strong glass ceiling. But you wonder how much it was part of the imagination of those in Pittsburgh to say, we need to imagine a different kind of baseball world where this is possible, even though right now it's not. We're not seeing. I'm giving you this illustration this morning because I think Pastor Peter is doing the same thing with the early church to say what you need to do is you need to rid yourself of malice, you need to rid yourself of envy, you need to rid yourself of slander, you need to become a different kind of people because of who you are, and this had to be outside of their imagination because Peter was the one disciple who was ready at any turn to draw his sword, cut off a servant's ear. If there was a fight, Peter was going to be there. And now we got Pastor Peter, who's saying what you need to do in your life and your lifestyle is show Christ in such a way. It's not so much about what you're saying with your mouth. It's what you're doing with your hearts and with your actions that bears witness to the gospel. And Pastor Peter sees a world that says, no matter what emperor, no matter what governor, no matter what king is in power, that God is above that person and establishes rulers and authorities. And part of Christian witness is to be a citizen of the kingdom. Paul says it too in Philippians 3, that your citizenship is in heaven. So you need a different kind of imagination because you don't belong to Rome, even if you're a Roman citizen. 
We hear this in Jeremiah 29 when there's a letter to the exiles. And we always quote verse 11. Uh, you know, I, I know the plans I have for you. But we oftentimes skip the early part of that, which is all about what you need to do is settle in in Babylon. You need to build houses. You need to, you need to pray for the good of the city. You need to develop your families. And as you practice good citizenship in Babylon, that will bear witness to a new reality that Babylon has never seen before. And Peter is taking those same words, the same notion of Exodus 19, when God's people are rescued out of, out of slavery in Egypt, to say, I'm bringing you to the base of this mountain, and you are going to be for me a new nation, a royal priesthood that brings blessing to the whole earth. Abraham's promises that a blessing will come through you to all nations is going to come through if you obey me and heed my commands. So if you live out what I'm calling you to, that will be your best witness and your best reflection of Christ. And we could say, well, wait a minute. Really? Is that how we do it? It seems to me that Peter is asking the church, he's calling to the church to be a people who are marked by a different spirit, marked by by a different attitude, marked by different actions, because they have participated in the baptism, in the suffering and in the death and in the rising again of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, whether you like Don or Tom, doesn't matter. What matters is resembling Christ. That's what matters. And Peter is writing in an in a environment, in a context, where Nero is the emperor. And if you know anything about Nero, he's a lot worse than anything we've seen in decades. And after him was Domitian, and it wasn't that much better. And Peter is saying, as part of your witness, as part of your discipleship, you need to have a posture of yielding and submitting because outsiders, pagans, those who don't know Christ are going to be looking at you and they're going to see you and they're going to see how you respond. So it's not about your position. It's about your posture. It's about your attitude. It is about wanting to be a kingdom of priests who fulfill God's call to be a blessing in the world. And it's, it's not because of rescue out of Egypt and out at Mount Sinai. It's being rescued in the person and the work of Jesus Christ who modeled a very different way of how to deal with enemies. It was never about drawing up a sword. It was never about protest. It was about showing respect to everyone. He even respected the Pharisees. So when you look at this, you say, I don't, know if, I don't know if I can do that. Peter says, you got to see yourself as a stranger, as a foreigner, as an exile, because you don't belong. You don't belong. In a culture that's behaving badly, in leaders that are behaving badly, Christians need to show and model another way. And it's about our posture and our attitude. And when we don't, Christian witness suffers. The gospel suffers. So today we could take a poll and we're not. You know, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you an independent? Are you frustrated? I want to say to you this morning, Part of our calling, that, that cannot be your first identifier. You are a citizen of another country. Hebrews 11. 
foreigners, strangers, exiles. This is how Scripture speaks about God's people. And it's about our behaviors and our attitudes. And our identification comes from the one who came to serve, who came to be a slave, who came to unjust to suffer unjustly, who even showed respect to Pilate, who washed his hands of all responsibility. And he, you know, you wouldn't have any authority if it was not given to you from above. Was he a smart mouth about that? I don't think he was. I don't think he was. I had a professor in college who I'll never forget. He encouraged us to think for ourselves. He encouraged us to push back when, when he said something that we didn't uh, necessarily agree with. But here's what he taught us. He said, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to challenge authority. But raise your hand first. Raise your hand first. I think there was a person who was formed and shaped by what had Peter had said. Now let's ask yourselves, how in the world did Peter, impetuous, you know, mouthy, speaking with bravado, Peter, how did he get to this point? Because he said, you know, Lord, let's go to Jerusalem. I'll, I'll die for you. We'll all die for you. We'll go to jail with you. Whatever, whatever it takes, we'll do it. We'll do it. Peter, who was a zealot who probably always had a concealed carry with his sword, always ready for, at what moment is the kingdom going to come? What brought about a change in Peter? I think it has to be what he saw in the upper room with the washing of feet and with what his Lord did in crucifixion, where somehow Peter... Peter's relationship with Jesus changed him, changed his mind, changed his thinking, changed the way he even looked at the world to say, it's not by power, it's not by control, but it's by loving and serving. It's by being a faithful witness that the world has changed. Oh. So that Peter has a change of heart. If today, during the fellowship time, over our cookies and coffee, we wanted to have a good argument about who's the best candidate or what's the best position, not recommending it, but if we did, if we did that, how many of us are going to change our mind by an argument? Uh -uh. How many of us change our hearts and minds because of a relationship? A relationship with a parent, a relationship with a coworker, a relationship with someone we love. These are the things that change us. These are the things that change the world. The world is not changed through better arguments. It's changed through relationship. And the church, the early church, knew it in some form as the underdog to say, you know what, we're not going to get to the place of power. And history shows that even when we do, it's probably not going to turn out so great. The world and the church is ch and the neighborhood is changed through relationship. It's through service. It's through love. And it's not through arguments. This is Peter's vision for how the first and great commandment works itself out. That's the lectionary text for next Sunday. I didn't pick it. It's in the lectionary. We're going to look at that. What, what's the first and second great commandment? that we love God and that we love others. And this is how it looks. This is how it looks. I gave you the two tablets of the law this morning. The first one in column two is honor and respect your parents, honor and respect those who are in authority over you. The catechism says, honor and respect those whom God has put in authority over you through through them God chooses to rule us. It's drawn right out of this text. And be patient when they fail. 
And so I want to say this morning, exiles and strangers and foreigners in this land. My concluding pastoral advice is that you and I cannot and do not have any control over the outcome this week. We have no control over it. But we have complete control in how we respond to it. And our witness is on the line. So how we talk and how we let others talk around us without, you know, if you remain quiet as someone is uh, using malice or slander, you know, the catechism is really clear that we are just as guilty if we allow someone to do that. We correct one another gently. We say to one another, the cross and the upper room have called us to a higher standard than that. Jesus, who has emptied himself of all power and authority and who has endured unjust suffering, has given us a different model, a different imagination than that. That's why I opened this morning with that illustration of PNC Park. This is a world that did not exist in 2001, and it barely exists now, but someone said we have to think differently. We have to reimagine the world. And Jesus gives us the model for what that is supposed to look like. And it's about practicing your goodness. It's about practicing kindness. It's about yielding and submission and respect. Live such honorable lives that even those who accuse you of doing wrong are disarmed. Honor and respect need to be the groundwork from which the church works to practice tikkun olam, out of which the world is healed and repaired. And we all know it's so much really easier to do it. So Peter gives us the recipe. Rid yourself. Slander, deceit, malice. Hold yourself and others to a higher standard. And I want to say, if, you know, this church is older folks, so I don't know if you do this, but if you've said something or you've posted something that's wrong or inaccurate or not truthful, you ought to correct it. You ought to repent of that and say, I had that wrong. I can't stand him or her. And that was behind that. And, but you ought to correct it. We ought to be the people who lead the way in practice self-correction. That's what the prayer of confession every week is supposed to be about. Merciful God, have mercy. Because I've, I've sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed. In action and attitude. And I've failed to love my neighbor and you. And I want to respond to you differently. For tikkun olam, for the repair, for the sake of the world, for the sake of Christian witness. And I want to offer this critique as for brothers and sisters in Christ. I think we've had a horrible witness the last number of years. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people saw the yielding, submission, humility, the love of brothers and sisters in Christ in us and said, I don't know who you people are. You're not from around here, are you? You're right. Because our citizenship is somewhere else. It's not tied to U.S. politics. It's not tied to U.S. US citizenship. It is tied to the kingdom of the one who has come and endured unjust suffering. So how you love God and how you love others, how you love mercy, how you love kindness, how you do justice very much matters in the next week and in the days ahead because there's a whole congregation, a whole community, and a whole world in need of repair and healing. 
And we got it right here. He himself bore in himself our sins that we might die to sins and we might live for righteousness. That to be the church is to be the kingdom of priests, the royal priesthood, the people who serve the world with our hearts and our hands and our ideas and our way of engaging the world in a way that resembles the one we follow. And the one we follow doesn't sit in any office. So calm or Don, neither one of them are the Messiah. Neither will save us. We've been rescued for a purpose, and that's to bear witness to the gospel in ways that are life-giving for the neighborhood and the community. And this is, this is Peter's own journey. He had to learn it over time. He thought it was about control and power. He thought it was about shooting his mouth off. And he began to realize that following Jesus is all about love and service. And it's enemy love. It's love for those in need. It's a transformed heart. And that's, that's what the church is all about. Tikkun olam. Help us join you in repairing the world. Because we are the only ones who see that Jesus emptied everything to come down, to suffer and to bear the weight of our sins, to begin to transform the whole world again. Resurrection Day, is, as N.T. Wright says, is the big bang of the new creation. And the church has given this, that message. The secret of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. Now go live it. And that's all about imitating Christ. Tikkun olam. Say it. Tikkun olam. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Help us, we pray, O oh God, to live as free people. But help us not to use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. Help us to live in the freedom of Christ. Help us, we pray, to join you in showing the world another way that it does not yet know, it has not yet seen, that's not yet here fully. Give us wide imagination and wide hearts and open hands to love you and to love the world in need. We pray for your mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. <coughs> the service uh, concludes with two things. One is the blessing, and then we're going to sing a song that's all about dedication and getting ready to serve. So won't you rise for the blessing? Brothers and sisters, remember your baptism. Remember whose name is on your forehead and in your heart. Remember the Spirit of God that lives within you, that prompts you and reminds you, that comforts you and challenges you. And as you hold on to that, may the love of God the Father, the companionship of the serving, suffering Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you today, in the coming week, and all of your days. And let all God's people say, Let's sing together. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send?
by the Lord of snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my words to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will. By the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts are satisfied. I will give 